Hello again. Like I said earlier, my name is Chad. I'm one of the pastors here at Vaughn Forest Church, and I'm excited to be here with you today as we are continuing our message series from stressed to blessed. For the last four weeks, we have been kind of journeying together, taking a look at some of the different things that cause stress in our lives and learning how to move from a place of stress into a place of blessing with them. We've talked about things like our marriages. We've talked about finances. We've talked about how we spend our time. And if you've missed any of those messages, I would highly encourage you head over to vaughnforest.com, head to our YouTube channel, all those previous sermons are posted there, and uh, I really think there is some great practical teaching in this series that can really uh, help you out in your everyday life. And so if you missed any of those, make sure you go get caught up. And we've said that our big idea for this series is that moving from stress to blessed has more to do with the internal condition of my heart than the external condition of my circumstances. So what does that mean? Well, simply this, that there's always going to be things in our lives that are seeking to cause us stress. We just named a few a moment ago, and there's Tons more, right? There's all kinds of things that bring stress into our lives. But that our reaction to that stress, the amount of stress we feel in our lives, is directly related to how much we are applying God's word to our life and the condition of our heart. So we can move from a place of stress with these things to a place of blessing when we apply God's word to our lives and when we make sure that our heart is in the right place. And so, like I said, we've talked about marriage, we've talked about finances, all these different things, and today we are going to be talking about something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot in church, if I'm being real honest, and has, you know, maybe it could be a little bit uncomfortable to talk about, but we do know that this subject is a source of stress for a lot of folks, and so today we're going to be talking about moving from stressed to blessed with my health moving from stress to blessed with my health. And as I say that, I can see what many of you are thinking. What is this chubby dad bod looking dude going to tell me about health? Like what, why is he even up on stage talking about this? But I think if you hang with me, I've got a really cool story to tell and I've got some great practical tips, some great insight from the word of God, how we can move from stress to blessed with our health because we know that it is something that so many of us experience stress with. Now, the question is, does God even care about our physical health? And the answer is yes. And if we look at our big idea for today, it's this, that our physical health has a direct impact on our spiritual, mental, and emotional health. So we know that our physical health has a direct impact on our mental and emotional health. We have seen study after study after study that has said that. And because it has an impact on our mental and emotional health, it also has an impact on our spiritual health. And of course, the Lord cares about things that have an impact on our spiritual health. Again, we've seen study study after study after study about this. So it's something that we do need to talk about. Now, the next question may be, does God's word even have anything to say about this? And the answer is yes, actually quite a lot. If we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, Paul writes, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The the scripture is literally saying that our bodies are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that when he left, he was going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and we want that dwelling place to be presentable. I think about What's it like? How many of you guys have ever been in this situation when uh, you've kind of let your home get a little bit cluttered? Maybe, you know, you, you, didn't fold, you didn't put up the laundry that you folded. Maybe there's dishes in the sink. There's just stuff that's kind of cluttered up over the days and the weeks and the months. And then all of a sudden you find out that you've got guests coming over. So what do you do? You immediately start grabbing everything and throwing it in closets, putting it in areas you don't think the guests are going to go, putting the dogs outside, getting the kids to help, and you are in a high-stress situation because you have allowed your home to become cluttered. Well, the same thing could happen with our physical bodies, which, are, which is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. If we don't maintain, if we don't clean up a little bit along the way, eventually it can get to a place of high clutter, and then we are super stressed because we're trying to get it into a place of health. Check out what Paul writes in Romans here. He says this, that therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true and proper 
worship. So not only are our bodies the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, but also it is a true and proper act of worship when we offer them as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So clearly our physical health is a big deal to God. It matters to God, and it is a source of stress for so many of us. And so in just a moment, I'm, I'm going to jump into kind of kind of telling you my story. When Adam and I were sitting down and we were talking about this series and the different things that, that cause us stress. You know, we were looking at all these different subjects, and when we got to health, which we could not ignore because it does cause so much stress, Adam said, hey man, I think you need to get up and, and teach this message because you've got a real cool story, and you've got a real interesting perspective on it. I said, you really think people don't, don't know about that? And he said, man, we've had so many new folks that have been coming recently. He said, I think there's a lot of folks that hopefully could be encouraged by it. And I said, well, absolutely, I'd be honored to share that. So let me give a couple of caveats at the beginning of this. First off, uh, A, we're not talking about some like Adonis level of fitness where when I'm done with this message, you're going to walk out of this room and run a marathon and deadlift 500 pounds, okay? That's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about getting to a place of physical health that is honoring to God. The second caveat that I would give you is that do not think, me standing on the stage telling you the story, that I think that I've arrived. Okay, I know that I still have a long way to go, and I know that it is still a journey for me. So I'm not standing up here telling you guys, hey, look at me, all lights shine on me. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying that over the last you know, 12 to 14 months, I have seen the Lord work in an incredible way, and I've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in my life when it comes to my physical health. So just real quick to kind of tell you my story. Uh, not this past August, but the one before that, so about 14 months ago, uh, I weighed 283 pounds. 283 pounds. I think I actually have a picture uh, of around that time. If we could throw that picture up. Yep, that was me. 283 pounds. This is me now. Yep. Let's get that off. I don't want to look at it anymore. And uh, I, my wife was after me to go to the doctor to get a checkup. My wife's a nurse, and, and so she was like, you need to go and just get, you know, an annual kind of checkup thing. And I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Now, why didn't I want to go do that? Have you ever had a test that you didn't study for and you knew you weren't going to get a very good grade on it? It was kind of like that. I knew that if I went to the doctor and had a checkup, that the news that I was going to get was not really something that I wanted to hear. And so, you know, my thought process was, well, if I don't go and get that bad news, you know, then I can't hear the bad news, and then everything will be fine, right? But that's not the way it was. And so my wife, she kept telling me, like, you need to go and get a checkup. I said, I'm not going. She said, you're going. I said, I'm not. She said, you're going. I said, I'm not. So I went. And, uh, and I remember standing on the scale. The reason I know that it was 283 pounds was as I stood on that scale and I saw that number go to 283 pounds, I couldn't believe it. You know, in my past, I had done some running, some biking. You know, it was, was generally pretty fit. And uh, I had fallen into this hole when I looked at that scale going, what in the world, how did I get here? And it didn't happen overnight. It was a very slow process, but I had gotten there into this really, really deep hole. And so they ran all kinds of tests, you know, just the normal checkup stuff. And uh, I remember sitting down with my doctor at the end of this visit and him going over some of the, uh, the tests with me. And he's like, dude, he's like, obviously, you got to lose a lot of weight. He said, your cholesterol is way too high. He said, your blood sugar is insanely high. He said, right now, you are 12 times more likely to become diabetic than a regular person. And I'd had family members that I had seen deal with diabetes. I, I knew what the effects of that were. Being a pastor, visited folks in the hospital who were dealing with that. And I just remember him telling me this and me going, my goodness, how did I get here? How did I get here? And so he put me on some medicine uh, to lower the cholesterol, to lower the blood sugar, and uh, sent me on my way. He said, I want to see you back here in about six months. He said, in that meantime, he said, you obviously know the changes you need to make. Here's some advice. Do these things. Get on this medication. I didn't want to be on the medication because every time I took one of those pills, it was a reminder to me I felt like a failure. And so driving home, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm praying, and I'm going, man, I just don't see a way out of this hole, and, but I know that I've got to do this. And I just said, Lord, I don't think I can do this on my own. And the Lord whispered to me, you're not going to have to do it on your own. And so I remember praying, like, God, give me the strength, show me the areas I need to change. I went to some friends to help encourage me along the way that I knew were praying for me. I made some small changes. It wasn't anything insane. Maybe I, getting up a few times a week to walk for 30 or 45 minutes, slow. Uh, some people go running. I go waddling. I waddle around my neighborhood. It's fantastic. I have a buddy that goes and waddles with me. And uh, just made some small changes, started eating a little bit healthier. And uh, over time, those changes kind of compounded on each other. And over the next six months, by the time that I went back to the doctor, I had lost 70 pounds. 
So gone from 283 down to 213. And I'll never forget being called back there. And the nurse, she wasn't really looking at me. She was looking at my chart. She goes, step up on the scale. And I stepped up on the scale. And she, like, kind of slid the thing all the way over. But it was really unbalanced. And so she looks up. She looks at that. And she looks at me and looks at that and looks at me. And she goes, this says you've lost 70 pounds. I said, it does? That's shocking. And she goes, is that, is that true? And I said, yeah, I've been, I've been trying, trying to get that done. So she puts me in the room. The doctor comes in. He goes, did you really lose 70 pounds? And I was like, well, yeah, are you telling me not everyone you tell to lose weight loses weight? And he was like, no. He said, most people gain weight. He says, as a matter of fact, he had another patient. I don't know if this is breaking confidentiality or not. He had another patient that said, well, I only added one more meal to my day. And anyway, that was a whole disaster for her. But, uh, and this is also a true story. I made a little certificate that I took with me on that doctor's visit. It had a gold star, and it said, most improved patient. And, uh, and so I handed it to the doctor as we were having this conversation. And I said, now, here's the deal. That's your certificate. You do whatever you want to do with that, whatever you feel like is appropriate. But if you feel like it, just slide that back across the table, and I'll be glad to take that from you. And he did, and he laughed. I've actually still got that certificate that says most improved patient. And, uh, but all of that to say, you know, it was an incredible experience during those six months dropping that weight. It wasn't easy. It was difficult. But like I said, I had so many folks encouraging me. I had so many folks praying for me. And it was incredible to see how God worked and moved. And so I went back those six months later with the goal of coming off of that medication. And my wife, again, she's a nurse. She told me, she's like, don't really expect that things often don't turn around that fast and so they did all the tests again and then uh, a, a couple of days later I got the results from the doctor and he said you can come off of all your medication in that moment I was like let's go now since then my season of life has changed a little bit and that rapid weight loss that I was seeing it slowed down but the important thing has been through folks praying for me through my own efforts through the power of the Holy Spirit I've been able to stay on that journey towards physical health. And so when Adam and I were talking about this, he said, man, I, I think that story can be an encouragement to some other folks. And that's my prayer is that that story is an encouragement to you that no matter how deep you feel like that hole that you're in, whether it comes to your physical health or anything else, there is always a way out. There is always a way through the power of the Holy Spirit to get out of that hole. And so today, I've got just some practical advice for you, some things that I've learned along the way, some things that I've picked up. So if you have your notes, go ahead and pull those notes out. And, uh, and I want you to kind of jot some of this stuff down. And if you're joining us online, you can find these notes in our Vaughn Forest Church app. But our first piece of practical tip for today in journeying towards physical health is to take an inventory. Physical unhealthiness comes in many different forms. Take an inventory. Physical unhealthiness comes in many, many different forms. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, simply that there's all kinds of ways we can be physically unhealthy. For me, it was overeating and not exercising enough. For others, it may be undereating and exercising way too much. For others, it may be you're working way too much, and that's taking a toll on your physical health. For others, maybe you're not sleeping enough, and that's taking a toll. For others, it may be some kind of addiction or some other kind of substance abuse. But it's so important for us to examine our lives to know what is it that is keeping us from that place of physical health. And what's really interesting is that the Holy Spirit can help us in this process of taking an inventory into our lives. Check out what it says in Psalms here. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because there are some things about our lives, about ourselves that we can't see or we don't know, but we can go to the Holy Spirit and he can reveal those things to us. Now, I've got a little bit of an illustration here. I've got four quadrants that I want to show you guys. Adam uses quadrants in his messages a lot, and he's not here today, so I wanted y'all to feel at home. But there's four quadrants when it comes to knowing things about my life. The first quadrant are the things that everyone knows. There are things about our lives that everybody knows. This could be things like your name. It could be like where you work. It could be like if you're married or not. Uh, there are things about our lives that everybody knows. It's apparent to everyone. We know it, everyone else around us knows it, and the Lord knows it. So quadrant number one, the things that everyone knows. Quadrant number two, the things that only God and I know. There are things about your life that you've managed to keep secret from everyone here on this earth, but nothing is kept secret from the Lord, but there are things that only you and God know. Now, what could this be? Maybe it's a secret sin. 
Maybe it's some desire or ambition that you have for your life that you've not expressed to somebody else. But there are things that only God and you yourself know about your life. Third quadrant, there are the things that only God and everyone else knows. So there are things about our lives that we cannot see that obviously God knows, and everyone else in our life knows these things. Everyone can see it. It's very obvious to them. We don't see it. Maybe it's even something like you've got bad breath. I have no idea. But there's different things about our lives that everybody else knows that we don't know. We'll talk more about this quadrant here in just a moment. And then finally, this fourth quadrant, there are the things that only God knows. There are things about your life that only God knows. Things like what's going to happen to you later in your life? What does your future look like? Maybe some deep desires or dreams that God has given you that you haven't even quite realized. Maybe it's your talents, your gifts, your abilities that you're not even aware of yet that the Holy Spirit has put in you. So there are things about our life that only God knows, and this also applies to our physical health. And oftentimes, it's important for us to go to the Holy Spirit to pray that prayer that the psalmist prayed and say, God, search me and reveal those things to me that I do not yet know. So we have to take an inventory. And once we have taken that inventory, we can go to point number two, which is decide to make a change. You have to decide to make a a change. Once the things have been revealed to you that you need to change, you have to decide to make a change. And my encouragement to you would be to make that decision before your day of desperation. Now, what is a day of desperation? A day of desperation is when you hit your limit, when you finally get to that point where you're like, I will do anything to change this about my life. For me, that happened in that car ride home from the doctor's office the first time after I had received all this incredibly bad news and I knew the trajectory that my life was on. I had to make a change and that was my day of desperation. My encouragement to you, you decide where your day of desperation is. Don't make it that far. Don't get so far down the hole where you feel like you have absolutely no hope of getting out. And what this requires is a level of self Discipline And self-discipline is not a term that we like to use a whole lot, but it is essential when you are deciding to make a change. And it can be so difficult. It can be so difficult for us to do. But the good news is, is once again, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us high and dry. Look at what it says in Philippians 4.13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This verse is not just about winning football games, right? Literally, the Holy Spirit is saying that I will give you the strength to make the change in your life. And so many people, they try and they fail because they're leaning only on their own strength and they're not looking to the Holy Spirit to provide for them the strength that they need to make a change. They're not looking to the Holy Spirit for the strength they need for this self-discipline. But it does also require effort on our part. It requires self-discipline on our part. And I love this quote from David Campbell. He's the founder of Saks Fifth Avenue. He says this, that discipline is remembering what you want. Discipline is remembering what you want. When you are in that moment where you can decide to make a healthy decision or an unhealthy one, discipline is remembering what you want. And driving home that day, I had to think about what I wanted. What was it that I really wanted? And as I thought about it, I thought, man, I want to be there to see my girls grow up. I want to be there to walk them down the aisle at their wedding. After my girls are out of the house, I want to be able to take vacations and trips with my wife and enjoy spending time with her. And more than all of that, I don't want to disqualify myself from being used by the Lord to expand his kingdom. I don't want to be so out of shape that I can't go on mission trips and take the gospel uh, both to here locally and around the world. I want to have the stamina to get up on stage and preach God's word faithfully. I don't want to do something that disqualifies myself from that. And while the Lord has these plans, we can do things that disqualify ourselves both spiritually and physically. So what did I want? I wanted to stay in the game. I wanted to be there for my family. I wanted to be there for my church, for the Lord. And so I had to stop and think about that. And so for us, discipline is remembering what you want. And this is not just a one-time thing. This is an everyday thing. This is an every moment thing. When you're sitting in the restaurant, you're going to decide, am I going to pick the healthy thing or the unhealthy thing? Or when the alarm goes off in the morning, you're going to say, am I going to get up or am I going to stay in bed where it's nice and warm and it's so cold out there? You have to remember what you want. And that is the key to self-discipline. Our third practical tip, get accountability. Get accountability. 
And this one is huge. Having accountability is huge. And there's several different types of accountability. I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is relational accountability. Relational accountability is probably what you're thinking of when I talk about traditional accountability. It's someone else holding you accountable, making sure that you're going to do the things that you say you're going to do, and you don't do the things that you say that you are not going to do. And God has given us one another to live in community with one another so that we can have, in part, this relational accountability. And God's Word talks about this all over the place. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, "...as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another." 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Ecclesiastes 4.12, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. God has given us one another to spur each other on towards health. Let's throw up that quadrant again and take a look at this third quadrant. The things that only God and everyone else knows. There are things in our lives that we cannot see, and God has put other folks in our lives to help us identify those things and move towards a place of health, move towards being stressed with those things to a place of blessing. And every one of us in our lives, we need folks that we can trust more than ourselves. We need folks that we can trust more than ourselves. We need people that can come to us and tell us the truth and know that we are going to receive that and know that they love us and know that we're not going to bow up against them so that we can have that truth and, again, move from a place of unhealth to a place of health, a place of stress to a place of blessing. And if you are looking for that, here at Vaughn Forest Church, we love getting folks connected. We love getting folks connected. Come find me after the service, and we would love to help make that happen for you. But that relational accountability, it's so important. Again, I think about my, I have a buddy that I go waddling with uh, several mornings throughout the week, and literally we text each other, man, hey, you going to be there in the morning? Absolutely. All right, I'll see you there. And there are mornings that I would not get out of bed if I didn't know that he was gonna, not going to be waiting out there for me. Knowing he's out there, I get up and I go, and we go and get done what we need to get done. There's another kind of accountability that we'll talk about, and that's financial accountability. So you have relational accountability and financial accountability. You know, what is financial accountability? We've talked about several times in the series that where your treasure is, there also is your heart. And I would also say where you put your treasure, that is what you are going to invest in. And probably the best example I can get from this, I have another friend uh, who has a similar story to mine, not quite as deep in the hole as I was, uh, but he went to the doctor and uh, the doctor said, hey, you really need to join a gym and start working out and, and get more physically you know, healthy. And so uh, he goes to a gym, he joins it, and he finds a personal trainer. And the personal trainer says, well, it's basically a 12-week Week, you know, commitment, but you only have to pay for the first two weeks here up front. And my friend said, no, I'm going to go ahead and pay for all 12. And, and the trainer said, well, why would you do that? He said, well, if I only pay for two weeks, I'm only going to show up for two weeks, and then I'm going to ghost you for the rest of it. He said, but I know that if I pay for all 12 weeks right now, that I will be financially committed, and I will have that accountability, and I'm going to show up. Now, his wife wasn't as happy with him when he got home that he had already paid for all 12, but it worked. He paid for all 12. He showed up every single time and was able to continue that process and get towards a place of health. So we have relational accountability. We have financial accountability. Whatever works for you is what I would encourage you to do as we move towards a place from being stressed to blessed with our health. Our fourth practical tip, don't get caught in a feedback loop of failure. Don't get caught in a feedback loop of failure. And this one is very, very easy to do. Now, what is feedback? Have you ever been to a concert or been somewhere where there's a sound system and somebody puts a microphone in front of a speaker and there's some noise and it goes through the microphone and through the system and then out through the speaker and then back into the microphone and through the system and out through the speaker and faster and faster and louder and louder and louder and eventually there's that ear piercing sound where you cover your ears. Anybody ever experienced that? Obviously, you don't experience that here at Vaughn Forest Church because our production folks are the best in the world, but I'm sure there's some other places you've been to where you have experienced that feedback, that cycle that grows and grows and compounds on itself. Well, this can happen, believe it or not, in our physical health. And here's what it looks like. Maybe you miss a day working out. You miss a morning, you sleep in. Okay, no big deal. I'll, I'll maybe make that up later. But then at lunch, you're like, well, I didn't work out this morning. I'm kind of tired. I'll try to work out again tomorrow. And maybe that night for dinner, you eat something that maybe you know you're not supposed to have, have an extra helping of dessert, something along those lines. And then that next day, you're like, well, you know what? 
that was yesterday, but honestly, the week's kind of already shot. I'll pick this up again maybe, you know, after the weekend and get back to it. And then the next week shows up, and you know what? You've already kind of done that for so many days. Eh, it's fine. I'll just kind of keep doing whatever I want. And eventually, you get caught in this feedback loop where it compounds on itself, and it leads to a place of incredible unhealth. The moments turn into a day, the day turns into days, turns into weeks, turns into months. We see this annually. You guys ever hear of anyone trying to make a New Year's resolution? Oftentimes what that is is someone trying to break that feedback loop of failure. And what happens? They make that resolution, you go to the gyms in the month of January, they're really, really full, you can't find a treadmill anywhere, but don't worry, come back in February, and I promise that many of those folks are back in that feedback loop. And it is so easy for us to get in that feedback loop of failure. But the good news is, is that again, the Holy Spirit provides help and a way out of that. And God's word gives us promises with this. Check out what it says here in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And what I would tell you right now, sitting in this room, watching online, wherever you may be, if you feel like you are in that hopeless situation, if you feel like you are caught in that feedback loop of failure, you have the ability right now to break it. You have the ability right now to make that decision to get out of that feedback loop of failure. And even the smallest decision can lead to an incredible course change for your life. Those decisions that I made after going to the doctor, it wasn't anything great. Like I said, I would go walking. I would try to, you know, choose better options when it came to my health. And eventually, those little decisions compounded. Now, when I left the doctor's office, I wasn't heading in a completely new destination, but I was able to go in a new direction. And the author and speaker, Jim Rohn, puts it this way. You cannot change your destination overnight, but you can change your direction overnight. So I was hurtling that way towards unhealth, and I wasn't just overnight able to get away from that, but through making incremental changes in my direction, I was eventually able to change my destination. It doesn't happen overnight. It can take a little bit of time, and this is a great reminder that leads us to our next point, which is this, that recognize your physical health is a marathon and a sprint. Your physical health is a marathon and a sprint. A healthy life includes both. And I know that seems counterintuitive, but, but stick with me here for a bit. Because, you know, sometimes we have to go super, super fast. We want to make up that ground. We're sprinting. That first six months, I was sprinting. I was going pretty fast. But then my season of life changed, and I had to move into a little bit of a slower season of my life when it comes to this physical health journey, and it became much more of a marathon. And what works for me may not work for you. For some people, like if you're like me, you know that you are not to be trusted at a buffet. You cannot have cheat days. It will not work for you because if you do have cheat days every single week, you know that you're going to fall into that feedback loop of failure. Now, other folks, you're like, look, I'm going to do this right you know, for five days and eat super healthy and work out every single day. And when the weekend comes, I'm going to relax out a little bit. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. You have to do whatever it is that's going to work for you. But ultimately, this physical health journey requires both intentionality and perseverance. Let's check out what Paul writes in the book of Philippians 3, 13 through 14. He says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I know what you're thinking. That's really easy to say, right? It's really easy to say standing up on that stage. But it's really hard to make that decision in the moment, and I get that. It's really hard to figure that out. And what I would tell you is what we're talking about here is it requires intentionality. I know that if I don't set up my workout clothes the night before, I'm not going to get up in the morning. I know that if I don't look at the menu of the restaurant I'm going to ahead of time and see what is going to be healthy for me, I'm going to pick the wrong thing. And ultimately what I've discovered is that I have to work at a pace that is going to work for me. I have to find a pace that's going to work for me. You have to find a pace that is going to work for you and stick to that pace. Years ago, when I did do running, we would do 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, things like that. We would always set a goal for the race. So say we wanted to do a half marathon in two hours. 
To do that, I knew that I was going to have to keep about a nine-minute pace. And so it was really important that at the beginning, when we felt all this energy, we didn't go out too fast so that we would have endurance to stay the course for the rest of the race. And inevitably, at every single one of these races, you would have these guys that the gun would go, and they would take off, and they were running, and they would leave us in the dust. And that never bothered me at all because I knew about a mile or two down the road, I was going to be laughing at them as I ran by, and they were walking, okay? Not really laughing, but you know what I mean. And ultimately what I discovered was that it was those who set a realistic pace for themselves, those were the ones who finished the race. And that's our goal. Our goal is to finish this race of physical health because, again, it matters to the Lord. It matters. So you don't, go too, don't do too much too fast. Set a realistic goal and stick to it. And this is going to bring us to our last uh, point for the day, which is make sure that your self-discipline includes times of celebration. Make sure that your self-discipline includes times of celebration. Now, I know this may sound a little bit contrary to what I just said, but it is so important that we do occasionally stop and we celebrate. Scripture talks about that there are different times and seasons in our lives. There are times of fasting, yeah, to be sure, but there are also times of feasting. Ecclesiastes puts it this way in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. It is important to know the season that we are in, and believe it or not, one of the most difficult things once you hit a healthy rhythm can be to relax that standard when appropriate and celebrate. We talked about this months ago when we talked about healthy rhythms of work and rest in our life, and the same principle applies. It's so important for us to make time to celebrate. And I remember back earlier this year, uh, I was in that kind of sprint season where I was really kind of blown and going with the weight loss. And, uh, and I remember it was my daughter Ava's birthday, and she came up to me, and she had a piece of cake in her hand. She said, Daddy, aren't you going to have a piece of cake? And my first thought was, no, I'm not going to have a piece of cake. Do you know the journey that I'm on? I'm not going to eat that. That's terrible for me. Absolutely, that would be the worst. And then I looked at her eyes, and my daughter just wanted her daddy to celebrate with her. She just wanted me to celebrate with her on her big day. And it was important that I stop in that moment and do so. It was important for my relationship with her. It was also important for me to pause for just a moment and celebrate because we don't want to let the pendulum swing too far one way or the other. So it is good for us to occasionally stop, like the verse says, to stop and to celebrate. And ultimately, that is what physical, a physical health journey is, is knowing the season you are in, setting the pace that you can stick to, having accountability, making that decision that you want to honor God with your body. And so here today, I would just ask you this question. Where would you say that you are? Sitting in this room, watching online, where would you say that you are? are you saying, would you say that your physical health is in a place where it's having a positive impact on your spiritual health, your relationship with the Lord? Would you say that it's having a negative impact? Would you say that you feel absolutely just stuck in that hole and hopeless? The band's going to come and, and lead us in a time of response here in just a moment. We're going to sing the song, Living Hope. And I can't think of a more appropriate song to sing. Because I know that feeling. I know that feeling that you feel caught in that feedback loop of failure. I know that feeling that you are stuck in that hole, that you feel hopeless. And what I would tell you today is that the Lord offers you hope. All you have to do is ask for it. All you have to do. You have to ask for help. Yes, it requires effort. Yes, it requires accountability. But ultimately, it starts with us asking the Lord for help to give us that hope. Pray with me. Father, we just love you. And God, I thank you that there is no situation, no hole that we can find ourselves in that you don't offer hope, God. You always give us hope. And so, Father, I pray for those who are in this room, God, those who are watching online, whatever their situation may be, God, that you would fill them with that hope today, that you would help them see the way out, and that is through you, that you would give them the courage and the strength to make that change, whatever it may be. God, to move from a place of feeling so stressed to a place where they can feel blessed with their physical health and in turn feel closer to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. During this response song, I would just encourage you